in the church. So um, I couldn't resist coming out here during this hymn sing earlier. It just seemed like they were having a little much fun. You know, some fun I needed to be a part of. So, uh, but your testimonies and your sharing together has warmed my heart. I want you to know I feel a, a sense of God's presence here in you and how you've shared testimony of his love and his salvation and your prayer request too. I'd like to pray that God would speak through me and bless us today as we open His Word. Would you pause with me once more? God of heaven, it's with thanksgiving that we open Your Word. Word of truth. Word that guides our lives in purpose, in message, in hope, in promise. And now we ask for Your anointing upon us as we listen for the moving of Your Spirit. For we humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Len, and thank you, Jervis, for sharing with you today as well. Glenn McDonald writes from a book that he, a book that I love called The Disciple Making Church. It tells a story of how his parents, when they came to their 50th wedding anniversary, any, anybody pass that season? Okay, 50th wedding anniversary, he invited his son and daughter-in-law to go on to a cruise with them. I've never done a cruise. People tell me I should do a cruise. Anyway, they went on a cruise together, and on the very first day as they were getting situated there in the boat, their family was together, and, uh, and Glenn McDonald's mother said to him, Glenn, this is so exciting to have you with us for this celebration, and notice what it says here in the brochure. Tonight, no, tomorrow we can have dinner with the captain. We can, we can get in line and shake his hand and, and get acquainted with the captain of the ship. Well, Pastor McDonald was quite frankly wanting a break from a lot of crowds and a lot of formality. And he thought to himself, how in the world am I going to get out of this one? Well, after an evening of overeating, and, uh, you know, indulgence and, uh, and some fun in the, in, on the ship. It was great. They went to bed. And at 4.48 in the morning, there was an announcement over the entire ship from the captain. It said this. We are sorry to have to awaken you at this time because it seems like there are two men missing on board. We fear that one may have fallen over. And with that, of course, everyone was awake. And the captain insisted that anybody, anywhere on the ship, they must return to their cabin and that they could do a quick census of the entire ship. Well, here's a ship with 1,700 guests, 700 crew. 15 minutes later, John Garcia was found in a place on the ship where he was not supposed to be. But Eric Armstrong had not been found. And so the captain ordered that the ship turn around and head back to where they were. After two hours, the sun was coming up. An announcement came over the ship again from the captain. And he said, we're so grateful that we found Mr. Armstrong. A U.S. Coast Guard airlift is taking him to safety. I mean, was, was this a, a senator? Was this the captain's son that got so much attention? Such a rescue? As the story unfolds, this Mr. Armstrong had had a little too much revel revelry that night and had been out on the bow of the ship doing that Titanic thing, you know, <laughs> and did a Peter Pan right off the bow of the ship into the water. But fortunately, they were able to find him and take him back and, and, and rescue him. And what a dramatic rescue when you stop to think about it. As Glenn tells the story in his book, he said, the next evening, do you know where I really wanted to be that night? He said, I would wait as long as necessary to stand in line to shake the hand of the man who would pull out all of the stops 
and turn that ship around and call in as much as necessary in order to rescue someone who had fallen overboard. What a picture of grace. What a picture of God's love. That he would care so much for one person that he would do whatever is necessary to win that person to himself. This is good news. This is very good news. Unfortunately, we live in a society that thinks it's on a cruise ship. And that they need to just do a perfunctory handshake to the captain. And take the advice very seriously to just go roam about the ship to seek your own schedule, do what you want, discover, overindulge and enjoy, live in splendor. That's the way we Westerners live, isn't it? Is that the way this society lives today? Do your own thing, enjoy your own day. Have everything that's all about you, isn't it? That's what life is. That's what our media tells us. Scripture paints a very different picture, though. Life is not about me. Life is not about my pursuits. It's not about your pursuits. Life on this earth, as God has created it, has one purpose, and that's to honor God. Amen. He's called us to honor Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and life. All our strength. That is what he's called us to do. That's what he's called us to be a part of. It is indeed about the captain. It's about the captain, Jesus. You know, Jesus talks about building his church. You recall the text. Don't turn to it. Write it down, maybe. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew, chapter, Matthew records the story of Jesus and his disciples going to a place called uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi. It was there... I've been to the place. It was there. There was a huge outcropping of rocks. And it's an amazing kind of place. And he takes his disciples near this point, no doubt. And it was there that he asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And, he, and, and it was there that he said, uh, some say a prophet, some say Jonah. Some say John the Baptist, come back from the dead. And then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter said, you are the you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're absolutely right, Peter. And I'm going to build my church. Those words are so important. He said, I'm going to build my church. And what? Say it. Do you know the verse? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The picture of the church as Jesus is creating and forming it, as if the church moves forward in mission, and there's nothing that the darkness of hell can do anything about. That the authority of the believer claimed in Christ, if obeyed and followed him, they can move wherever they need to go, wherever there's a lost sinner, and save them from God's purposes. It's God's will that the church be mobilized for his purposes. Jesus takes, makes a direct connection between his ministry as the Messiah and the ministry of his church. That the role of Christ is to save the sinner, but the role of the church is to go find him. Do you believe that today, folks? You see, the Christ is the message, but the fellowship of the believer is the method. Jesus is our hope, but a loving church brings this hope to the world. Jesus is our redeemer, but forgiven people are called to be redemptive. Jesus is our high priest, and he's called you and I to be the priesthood of all believers to a broken world, to a sinner who lives near you or works next door to you, someone you know, someone that you care about. God's great redemptive acts are written in his word. When you think about the big signposts, through history. God has enormous, big, redemptive acts that he has done. The very first is that he had a plan from the very beginning that should the world go astray, he had a plan of salvation. Amen. Known from the foundations of the world. What does the scripture say in Revelation? The Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. We know that before Adam was even created, there was, in case Adam would fail, a way of salvation. The greatest act of redemption was already in play, all ready to go if it happened. 
God provided for Adam and Eve to cover them and show them a new way. Fast forwarding, the flood is actually an act of God's redemption. Of course, it's judgment too, but it was more about saving the planet than it was destroying the planet. The call of Abraham is an act of redemption. The exodus and God's people before Sinai building the tabernacle and understanding the way of salvation, the great gift of the message of salvation. And fast forwarding thousands of years, we come to Jesus, the greatest gift God could ever give to the planet. His plan of salvation through Jesus. The church is to continue the message of Jesus. Let's talk about this great challenge of the church today. You see, we live in a society that tends to be passive in nature. We like to be entertained. We like to be served. We like to ring a bell or ring the door and have the service come to us. That's typical. It's human nature, quite frankly. It's probably my human nature and yours to some degree. But God has called us not to be the attractive church, but to be the sending church. There's such a difference between attracting people to come here and this church going out there. There's quite a difference there, isn't there? Yes. Shall my religious experience, shall my walk of faith be about my interest, or should it be about God's purposes? What do you think? Should my church experience and my faith experience be about my preferences, my style, the way I like to sit, the way I like to sing? Or should it be about trying to find a method that will reach someone for God? Amen. There's a contrast there. For you see, I can come to places like this and say, this is the way I like to sing. This is the way I like to worship. This is the way I like to pray. And Pastor, please don't preach that way. And this is the way I like the teacher to teach. And it's all about my agenda rather than thinking, who's my neighbor that needs to hear the good word? Yeah. And then I go find them. Yes. There's the challenge of the church today. Will we, will we be about attracting people or will we be about sending people to those that need the gospel? Maybe it's both. Maybe it's both. We can be passive or we can be purposeful. Society today says keep your religion to yourself. Anybody ever hear that? <laughs> I hear it. Keep your religion to yourself. That's an Eastern philosophy. Confucius speaks to that philosophy. Let me share with you something that he wrote. Watch this now, the way it reads. Do not do unto others what you would not want for yourself. You've heard similar words before. Who said it? But they're different, aren't they? Listen carefully. Do not do unto others what you would not want for yourself. Now, I love this because later is when Jesus said this. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. And that's very fascinating. One is passive. It's about my world, my experience, and making sure that I don't do to others what I don't do to others. But on the other hand, Jesus says, no, this is about mission. He said, do to others what you would have them do unto you. Well, what would you have others to do to you? Love you. Well, therefore, love them. It's about a choice within the believer to go show and do and give and share. The whole reality is flipped on its head, isn't it? This is an amazing truth. The difference between Christianity and all other religions. Christianity is a sending religion. It is a belief that God has called us into this world, into this community of faith, to go. Did he not say, go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. Oh, wow. Powerful words. Join me, please. Go to the Word with me now. I want you to see something very precious. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. We're not going to be long in the Word, but unless I get distracted. But let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to hear, I want you to see what the Apostle Paul has to say about disciple-making. You see, Apostle Paul had a passion for sharing the gospel with others. He wanted to make sure that, what, that the gospel he shared with Timothy was going to someone else after him. I want you to watch this carefully. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You ready to go there? 
All right, good. You can talk to me, church, okay? You can talk to me. It's okay. You might want to read chapter 1 later today, but I want you to go to chapter 2 for our time's sake. He writes, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That sounds like words to Joshua. Come, going into the promised land. He said, be strong and be courageous. Paul is saying to Timothy, be strong. Overcome your fears. Be strong, trust in the Lord is what he's saying. Watch this. In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, when you're in Christ Jesus, there can be nothing that can take you away from him. Nothing can separate you from the love which is in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, the world may pass away, but you are solid in faith in Him. Your life may be facing illness or disease or separation or brokenness and who knows what. But if you're in Christ Jesus, nothing can be taken from you. Because it is a gift of God. 